96 kHz, 192 kHz, 384 kHz or higher or DSE 256? Does it really sound better? Over the years I have learned that things are not always what they seem. What about high res music then? For more than 10 years now, music that is recorded at higher sampling frequencies have become available to the consumer and many people hear improved sound quality. How come and what is high res? In this video I will explain my current view on the matter, based on the journey through digital audio from the early 80s up till now. I've seen the first developments in the studio. With my editorial team at that time we have tested and reviewed professional recording gear like the Sony and Otari digital multitracks, professional DAT recorders and digital mixing desks, the first DCS analog to digital converter and so on. And of course digital consumer products like CD players, network players, DACs and the like. I have seen CD players go from 14 bit to 16 bit to 20 bit and even 24 bit all for reproducing the 16-bit CD. When network players came to market, higher sampling frequencies became available. First there were many ripped SACDs that were converted to DSD and further converted to PCM96 or 192 kHz, the highest sampling frequency players at that time could handle. And we all thought it sounded better due to more information. Currently I seriously doubt that both 24-bit and higher sampling frequencies contain more relevant information. But that doesn't mean high res can't sound better. But first about the misuse of the high res label. The Japan Electronics and Information Technology Industries Association has dreamed up a nice black and yellow high res logo so the consumer can recognize the higher quality. On the side of this organization is stated that high res stands for 24 bit 96 kHz or higher. But I have seen high res defined as higher than 44.1 kHz 16 bit. So by that definition high res can also be 48 kHz 24 bit. So you better check the specifications for yourself. Your DAC or digital player will most likely indicate the sampling frequency and the bit tap is less relevant. I'll come back to that. But even if your DAC indicates it's a 96 kHz audio file, that doesn't mean it really is recorded at that sampling frequency. In the beginning of high res there have been companies that simply upsampled 44.1 or 48 kHz files to 88.2 or 96 kHz. Funny enough that would have been not too much of a problem if the upsampling was done to perfection. Which wasn't always the case. And then there is the immoral factor, selling something else than promised. I haven't heard about these practices for quite some time now, so I presume that's behind us. The better studios often record in 24 bit resolution and for a good reason. As soon as you start modifying digital audio, extra bit depth does help maintaining the sound quality since the rounding in the signal processing happens with higher precision. It's like why supermarkets use those odd prices like 2.98 euros, as where at the pay desk it is rounded to 3 euros. But if you buy two pieces it's 5 euro 96 and that is rounded to 5.95 so instead of paying 2 cents more you now pay one cent less. I should explain that in my country payments are rounded off to five cents. So even if the recording is intended for CD, it pays to record in 24 bit. Converting it back to 16 bit using proper dithering gives a more accurate signal than when all was recorded in 16 bit. For distribution as audio file it might help to have 24 bit resolution for the upsampling process but that is digital signal processing too. But finally about 20 bits is the best that can be reproduced since almost no DAC has analog electronics that exceeds 120 dB dynamic range and that equals 20 bits resolution in the digital domain. For 24 bits a dynamic range of 144 dB is needed. 
especially people that are uncertain about their auditory perceptions, love to bury themselves in figures. 24-bit must be better than 20-bit, and so on. In reality, we can't handle 20-bit dynamic range. Let's say you listen at 100 dB SPLA, and that's extremely or even unrealistically loud, and have a listening room that has a noise level of 30 dB SPLA, and that is very low for a listening room, let alone a living room. Then there is 70 dB of dynamic range possible. Now our hearing can hear sounds into the noise, so let's add an extra 10 dB for that. But even then the 96 dB of dynamic range of a CD would already suffice. In reality our hearing doesn't like such a large dynamic range. In fact the instant dynamic range of our hearing is far more limited. It shifts the window, like our eyes adapt to the light conditions, our hearing adapts to the loudness levels. Sudden large changes in brightness will blind you or put you in the dark for a moment. Sudden large changes in loudness levels, so called macro dynamics, are uncomfortable in the same way. One of my viewers, Michael Rovner, once sent me an unprocessed recording he made of a symphony orchestra. So it has the full dynamics that were there during the recording. And it's unplayable without constantly adjusting the playback volume. Even on my setup 1A. That is why all music is reduced in dynamic range. With classical music often gain riding is used. Here the sound engineer looks at the music score and slowly makes volume changes so to reduce the dynamic range of the music. In all kinds of rock, pop and other electronic music it is mixed to a low dynamic range using all kinds of compressors. So a number of less significant bits remain unused and could be left out of the system. And that can be done if the right dittering is applied. 14 bits resolution would already offer 80 dB of dynamic range, more than enough for the possible 80 dB I mentioned in the example earlier. And that was an unrealistic dynamic range. 12 bits might suffice in many cases. Now using 12 or 14 bits is inconvenient in the digital world, for that likes to work with multiples of 8 bits, so 16 or 24 bits. So for distribution 12 or 14 bits would suffice, while we get at least 16 bits. Higher sampling frequencies offer more bandwidth. 96 kHz sampling offers, according to the Nyquist theorem, a bandwidth of 48 kHz. And 192 kHz sampling offers a frequency response up to 96 kHz. But do we need that? We humans are capable of hearing up to 20 kHz and then only when we are young. See my video about our hearing for an overview of videos I did on the subject. Music hardly ever contains information above 20 kHz. And if it does, it will be at low level and might be lost in the system or in the air between the speakers and the listener. So we could easily conclude that high res music serves no purpose at all. But that would be in conflict with what I hear, and with me lots of others. High res recordings often sound better than CD quality. What is going on? Well, when recording music digitally it first has to pass a filter that filters out all information above half the sampling frequency. So when recording at 96 kHz the sound has to pass a shelving filter at 48 kHz and at 192 kHz that is shelving at 96 kHz. At playback the signal has to be filtered again at half the sampling frequency. When recording for CD the sampling frequency is 44.1 kHz, so there should be no signal above 22.05 kHz. Normally the filtering starts around 20 kHz and since the CD works with 96 dB of dynamic range, the filter should attenuate 96 dB at 22.05 kHz. Filter steepness is expressed in dB per octave. When a loudspeaker uses a crossover filter of 24 dB per octave, it is considered to be very steep and difficult to make good sounding. For CD we are talking 96 dB and not per octave, but per single note. That is about 4 times 7 is 28 times steeper. Such a filter has a profound impact on the sound quality. And by the way, 
44.1 kHz and 48 kHz in practice make no difference. The same goes for 88.2 and 96 kHz and 176.4 and 192 kHz. So manufacturers started looking for solutions. Philips was the first to come with an oversampling CD player. It was their first CD player, the famous CD100, that already had it. Simply put, it works like this. The original digital signal is sent to a digital signal processor that calculates between every two samples three extra samples. Since there now are four times as much samples, they have to be converted at four times the original speed. Or put differently, instead of a sampling frequency of 44.1 kHz, the signal now has a sampling frequency of 176.4 kHz. That would mean a shelving filter at 88.2 kHz. But that is not done. Instead the filter started far lower. I don't know the filter frequency of the Philips player, but let's say it starts at 30 kHz. Then the filter needs to be down 96 dB at 88.2 kHz, meaning a far less steep filter can be used. And a less steep filter sounds better. Now if you play 96 kHz files over an oversampling DAC or player, it might sound even better because the extra samples are not calculated but true samples. It appears to be rather difficult to properly upsample in chips that are cheap enough to use in affordable DACs and digital players. So indeed, properly produced 96 kHz files will often sound better than 44.1 files in affordable digital equipment. And 192 kHz files even sound better on most equipment. But what if a DAC or player manages to upsample almost perfectly? Well, then 44.1 kHz files might sound as good as 192 kHz files. But that is only found in true high-end players. About the same goes for high-end non-oversampling DACs that use analog reconstruction filters that also have less difficult task when a signal at higher sampling frequency has to be converted. I came to this conclusion after buying the Court Dave DAC and the Grim Audio Mu1 player using the upsampling in the latter. It really doesn't matter anymore if I play 192 or 384 PCM tracks or 44.1 kHz ones. If there is a quality difference, it probably is due to the different mastering. And not always the 192 kHz files sound better than the 44.1 kHz ones. The reverse also happens. The same goes for DSD by the way. The problem is that this level of equipment is rather expensive. Therefore, for most people, real high res tracks will sound better and be a better investment over 44.1 tracks. And with this thought, I leave you. I'll be back next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I am Hans Beekhuizen. Thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.